You're listening to the Straits of Video Podcast with Rob Lane. Welcome along to, now wait for it, episode 70 of the Straight to Video Podcast. 70 freaking episodes. That's crazy. But it's down to you lot for your support and encouragement that's got it this far. And I'm so happy to have you along on this ride. So I think 70 episodes deserves to be an extra special show. And this one certainly is, as I welcome Mr. Matt Willis to the Straight to Video podcast. Matt is a musician, songwriter, actor, TV and podcast presenter. But you guys will all certainly know him as the bass player of the power pop band Busted. For those that might not be aware that after splitting up at the beginning of 2005 with four number one UK singles, millions of album sales and two Brit Awards in the bag, Matt along with his busted bandmates James Bourne and Charlie Simpson reformed in 2015 and since then have released two amazing albums in the form of Night Driver and the more recent Halfway There. If you love great power pop tunes then these are both great, great records you should certainly own. Matt and I have been going back and forth to set up this chat for a couple of months and I'm so glad we finally got to do it. It turned out we have a few mutual friends including local Derby film producer and previous guest on this show Dominic Burns who Matt has worked with on the movies Allies and also the Jason Mewes film Madness in the Method. And there's also a name that will be familiar with any fans of the Wild Arts who are listening who might be surprised to hear that everyone's favourite guitar tech Dunk previously worked with Matt many moons ago and they became really good friends. I remember on a tour a few years ago, Dunk had nothing but good things to say about Matt, which was really great to hear. I have such massive respect for this guy, for what he's done in his career, and particularly how comfortable he is with the person he's become and how he carries himself today. We cover a lot of things in this chat. We obviously discuss a lot about Busted, their formation, Split, and where they are today. We chat about the supergroup Muckbusted, and we also cover a lot of Matt's early upbringing and the struggles he had at school. Matt is super open and honest throughout. Very funny, very potty mouth, which you'll be glad to hear, and generally just the perfect guest for this show. I went into this chat with high hopes for a good one, and Matt certainly did not disappoint. So I really hope you enjoy listening to this as it's one of my favourites I've done. And if you're not familiar with Matt and Busted, you might give them a chance after this. Or why not check out Matt's own podcast, When No One's Watching, which is awesome and available on all podcast platforms. So enough of me, let's dive in to episode 70 of the Straight to Video podcast with Mr. Matt Willis. Hi, man. Dude, I'm so sorry. I am so fucking sorry. <laughs> Literally, I got your text and I was in the middle of teaching my youngest to do something called the Cup Song, which has been their music project for, of course, two weeks. And I haven't fucking done it. <laughs> and um, and it was in today. They had to show it at like their live lesson at 1.30. So I was trying to teach my four-year-olds. It's like rhythm thing, which is actually really cool. Um, and I started doing it. I was like, fuck, man, we could have had this wicked in fucking two weeks. <laughs> Nothing changes from when you're a kid leaving everything till the last minute. Always, always. That is um, that is a, um, that is is a an ongoing problem in my life. <laughs> Do you know what? And I try to rectify it so many times and say, this time, 
this year I'll be better at blah blah blah. But um, it's not always the case. Nice t-shirt, by the way. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks. Do you know, this is um, yeah, it's a proper old vintage one. It was great. I found it and I was like, boom, done. I've had it for years. And it's also I've had it for years. And it's, yeah. Um, yeah. Considering it's from like the fucking early nineties, held up well. Faith No More, one of those bands, man, that still sound vital and fresh to this day. You put them on, you're like, holy shit. Yeah, man. Do you know, I can't. I, I don't know what film it was in, but my um, my eleven year old randomly in the kitchen the other day went be aggressive be, be. i was like whoa 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 oh where did you hear that <laughs> what was that? what is where going on how do you how do you know that of all the songs you know so um any idea where they had it really cool that had it's a movie and i was like what movie we need to watch that movie right now because they've got a cool soundtrack it's crazy what kids know these days like i speak to somebody and like crazy train by ozzy osbourne is in like some kids film these days whereas yeah yeah in the 80s it used to terrify people when that came on the radio exactly man you know like trolls the movie trolls we were watching that with my kids and them and trolls 2 the movie like it's got great fucking soundtrack they got loads of really cool i mean it's the trolls singing these songs but like (laughs) you know like they've got these fucking like you know like hurricanes in it and stuff i was like wow great brilliant the songwriters probably ain't more from that version than the original version I know, I know, I know, I know. But um, but I still learn more from the Jonas Brothers version of Year 3000 than I do of my version, so I can't complain. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. Dude, thank you ever so much for doing this. I appreciate it. Brilliant. I'm stoked to be here. I know I've got a, a bunch of mutual friends, obviously. Dominic from Derby. Who, yeah, we see, yeah. He's a good dude, man. How did you hook up? Was it through Allies or did you know each other before then? Um, yeah, yeah. I auditioned for Allies. I did a self-tape for Allies. And it wasn't until like um, the day of turning up on set that someone kind of told him that, you know, I was kind of in a band and stuff like that. And he was like, all right. And he he didn't really know much about us, you know. So then it was really nice to kind of work, you know, in, in a fucked up way to kind of go on set and then go, oh, oh, so you don't know anything else about me. You just kind of cast me as an actor. Fantastic. That makes me feel fucking great. Yeah. And then we've just been mates ever since, really. We've kind of really kind of, um, we've been working on something for about two years now, I think, writing something together, which has been just the most amazing experience, kind of like doing that, starting something with an idea and seeing it turn into something on paper that you're sending people. It's just fucking so exciting. You know, it's um, it's a really been an amazing experience. How was the Jason Muse experience? <laughs> Man, that was, um, that was really fucking awesome. You know, I mean, to be honest, I actually was probably the only person on set that wasn't like the hugest fan of that Kevin Smith world. I came to it through Dom, really. I actually went on one of my first ever dates was to go and watch Dogma. Took a girl called Jodie Albert to the cinema to watch Dogma. And about 45 minutes in, she wanted to leave. And I knew that I was never going to go out with this girl ever again. I was like, this movie's fucking amazing. You want to leave? And I was really cross. And so when we left halfway through, so I actually bought another ticket, went back to watch it again another time. Um, so I kind of knew them from that and kind of knew, knew of, um, I knew of Kevin Smith, obviously. I mean, who doesn't? I'd heard him speak at various things. I mean, he's such a captivating dude. And I knew, and I didn't really know that much about Jason. And, um, obviously I knew his character, you know, and, um, as Jay. You knew Jason Muse then pretty much, <laughs> if you knew the character. Yeah, but you say exactly, pretty much. Yeah, exactly. You know, so I just turned up on set, like, um, because Dom had, um, told me about this role they, that they wanted me to, to look at. And I had a few ideas about doing it slightly differently to maybe what they had initially planned. And, um, kind of talked through it with Dom and he was like, yeah, cool. Just bring that to set. Don't tell anyone. And I was like, all right, cool. You know, me and Jason just hit it off straight away. He was really kind of, um, you know, he's still a really awesome, creative dude. You know, there's kind of people that like, I don't know, you just get instantly. You know, it's I mean, quite infectious. There's so much going on in the guy's head. It's really infectious. He's really infectious. And his energy is just like, it's just boundless. And like you said, it's really infectious. Like on set, like it's a struggle though, because uh, sometimes like he's he's really good at getting work done. But there's a point where you're like, are we fucking around or are we filming? <laughs> You know what I mean? Like there's that kind of crossover. I'm like, what's going on now? Are we are we fucking around? Is this is this going yet? What's going on? You know, there's, there's kind of that kind of like slightly crossover about it. But um, you know, it was amazing to be part of his first directing gig and like a movie which him and Dom were kind of like, you know, it was a real passion project for them, like to get that movie made. And they worked like motherfuckers to get it made, you know. So um they really, really worked their ass off to get it on the screen. And it was great. It's just great to be a part of it. I was really stoked to be there. How long's it been since you've seen Dunk? Oh my god, Dunk. Um what guitar tech Dunk? Yeah. Oh my bloody God, man. Fucking hell. Yeah, that's a mutual friend. Um, it's been years and years and years. Yeah. Like I love that guy. Like, um, do you know, I haven't seen him. I haven't seen him 
in a what feels like a lifetime because I haven't seen him since I've stopped drinking, really. Like, I mean, we were party boys together, like, and he was great at that, you know. Uh, and we got on great. We were fucking, we were perfect for each other. You know, and, and the plus, but he really is, one, fantastic at his job as a guitar tech, you know. And, and the thing is, I've been lucky to have a few guitar techs and bass techs. And when you get a good one, you just want to hold on to them because you know that you're in good hands. Because the last thing you need to worry about is any of that shit during a gig. Like you just want it to go well. You know, once you get to a certain level and you can get guitar techs and stuff, which is also, you know, I can't believe someone's tuning my guitar for me. Like, yeah. but, um, but, you know, like, but for like, Without being a dick, like this sounds like a really pretentious thing to say, and I don't mean it to, but it's my truth. Like Busted, our first gig really was like a 4,000 capacity gig. We played like a few acoustic gigs in record companies, and we played like a few outdoor kind of summer festival kind of vibe, like pop shows, party in a park-esque kind of shows. And then we released the album. It fucking went down well, and they released a tour on it. And so our first kind of London show was Hammersmith Apollo. So I'd never really, for instance, I went into a room with a few mates of mine a couple of years ago to start a side project band, uh, which didn't end up happening, but we just went in there. I wrote a few songs, and we kind of got together. We smashed them out in the rehearsal room for a few weeks, right? So I was like, I have no fucking idea how to set my gear up. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> which was a really shit thing to say i was like i was like dude like i'm like bass lead amp that's all i need to worry yeah i was about. like i have no idea Like, i've got something called a kemper which like they just plug in and it has my bass sound and i press that button and it sounds good and i press that one that's distorted that's it <laughs> you know like um like that's my thing but i suddenly was um was very aware how how much of a privileged life i have led <laughs> when it comes to bands and setting up and playing shows so um i'm sorry if suddenly people fucking hate me for saying that but that was um it was suddenly very apparent to me that i had skipped quite a few steps mm-hmm. <laughs> you know and that, that were maybe integral you know in kind of forming like for instance with bass sound and stuff like i really struggled for years like, with that because then um, when busted made the first record i could barely play when we got signed me and james both played guitar and we wrote the first album together you know and then we couldn't get a fucking record deal for love nor money and we played to quite a few of them and no one was interested with the same songs played what i got to school for in the room no one cared and and then suddenly we, were, we auditioned, got handsome frontman Charlie Simpson in front of us, singing, sounding like a fucking god, playing guitar like a motherfucker, and suddenly got signed within two weeks, you know, and had like a label bidding war. We were like, oh, right, all we needed was a really handsome frontman. <laughs> you know, of course, you know, these fucking two skater dorks aren't going to get a record deal. But then when it came to recording that record, I just said, like, they were like, you can't, when it came to the actual signing of the band, they were like, you can't all three play guitar. It's weird. You know, one of you's got to play bass. And so um, that was unfortunately me. So I'm sorry to everyone if you're, if you. <laughs> I got to say one thing that just kind of skyrocketed my respect for you was when I heard about how you talked about how James and Charlie were like, they're like naturally gifted musicians. Give them any instrument and within like half an hour, they'll have figured out some kind of structure and stuff like that. Whereas you said you're like, you really have to work at it even to this day. The level of humility saying that is huge. And I think a lot of people in bands can respect the hell out of that because I think a lot of us are, excuse the pun, but we're kind of waiting to get busted and found out at some point. Yeah, <laughs> no, totally. I mean, I've I've been through that my whole life. Like I really have like that struggle, that kind of, you know, I think they call it imposter syndrome. But for me, it's kind of true. You know, so it's like, it's like, I know what you're saying, but it's not fake. It's actually real for me. Like I'm not really good enough to be here, you know? So, um, well, I wasn't for a good few years, you know? So it was, um, but you know, but the, if anything, that kind of um, like the McBusted thing happened, I hadn't picked up a guitar for like fucking seven years, eight years or something. Really, I hadn't. I've been acting, I've been doing stuff, I've been pursuing other careers and I hadn't even thought about it. Like I never thought Busted would get back together. I never thought we'd play shows again. I never thought anything would happen. So I hadn't played for ages. So I went into like like a crash course for like six months. I knew McBusted was happening. I knew it was going to happen. I knew we were going to tour to some level. And so I just sat down with a bass teacher three times a week and played my ass off and played a couple of hours every day. And so when I walked into the McBusted rehearsals, I was like, I feel good. <laughs> like, like, I feel capable and good about this. You it's know? just the preparation, isn't it? It just makes it so much comfortable. Yeah, man. You know, and that's still and that's still for me now, if I'm honest. Like every time Busted Tour, I start about three months before everyone else. And like James and Charlie literally walk in the room having not done any prep. You know, they're so good. You know, they just walk <laughs> they in. They can remember all the songs. Well, no, Charlie can't remember a lyric to save his <laughs> life, you know, but um, but um they can kind of they can blag it. They can blag it, you know, and like no one and and to be honest, like normally you have like 
guitarist ego in a band where everyone wants to play the lead, right? It's the opposite in Busted. No one wants to play anything hard because they just want to jump around and have a good time. You know, so, so, uh, so for me, but then I start a few months before and I just start working on it because I, I, I can't stand that feeling of being on the back foot in the room. Like I don't want to feel like that anymore. Like I felt like that for years. And do you know what? I felt like it for years and I had no one else to blame but me. You know, so I was like, I was like, right, okay, cool. Well, then you need to step up a little bit. And um, like I practice every day. My bass is there. Like at the moment I kind of play, do you know what? I say I practice every day. I fiddle around most days now. But in the next couple of months, I'll start kind of formulating some kind of structure again as to practice. You know, because we've got, you know, plans busted, have got plans to come back and do things, you know, so it's kind of like um, we were kind of talking about yesterday a little bit. So there's things in the air about what we're going to be doing next. I mean, obviously, the world is a very different place right now. So the thought of playing any kind of show whatsoever would be a dream. I was fine for about a year, to be honest. I like being at home, but now I'm getting a bit of an itch again now. (laughs) Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. I go down to YouTube Wearmore with all like the performance videos and stuff like, oh, I want to do a gig now. I'm ready. Yeah, man. There's something about it, man, isn't it? I went to watch McFly play at the O2, like, a, oh, God, like last November or something. Not the one just gone, the one before. I played a one-off show at the O2. I was so proud of them for getting back together. And I know they've been through a lot of shit. And then some of my best friends in the world, you know, it's so like, I knew kind of what the journey was to get them there. It was so, I was so thrilled for them. But part of me was like, fucking give me a guitar right now. <laughs> That's the thing about going to a gig. It's the black and white. You love being at a gig, but you're like, fucking hell, I'm jealous now. I want to get on. Yeah, I'm really jealous. You know, like, um, like I'm really, really jealous. And also really inspired. You know, like I remember, um, you know, like certain bands. I remember when I first saw My Chemical Romance play, I just wanted to run home and pick up a guitar immediately. I was just like, I need to write songs immediately. That band really had an effect on me. You know, and the same as certain bands I hear now, you know, like um, if I ever listen to The Clash, the same thing happens. I'm like, man, I've got something I need to do. You know, <laughs> like something I haven't done yet. You know, there's something in me. You know, it happens It happens all the time, you know, but um, I just love music. I love the recent When No One's Watching podcast with all three of you from Busted. Oh man, yeah, that was really fun. Charlie had me dying with the smelling of CD covers. Oh, really? Do you do that as well? Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> so many people messaged me about that. I thought that was the weirdest thing in the world. I thought no one's going to do that. So many people. I know exactly it. what it means about like the different grades yeah. of paper. Yeah, so many, know, so many people know all about that and do that. I was like, what a weird secret thing to have, like liking the smell of CD covers. But it's a big deal, apparently, the smell yeah. of shit. <laughs> smell of shit. <laughs> But yeah, so, um, but that was really fun. Like, I, I like doing this podcast. It's been a saving grace during lockdown, if I'm honest. We started it before lockdown. We had an idea, this kind of comedy podcast, and we're kind of going to do it and pursue it. And we started it, and we had like four, I think, maybe three. And then lockdown, we're like, oh, well, that's that over with, you know. And then luckily, we just kind of found a way to do it online, and it just worked. And in fact, because it was lockdown, we started getting really good guests. Yeah, everyone's like everyone's sat, sat at home doing fuck all. We're like, <laughs> you're like, do you want to come on my podcast? They're like, yeah. I was like, wicked. <laughs> you know, slip into their DMs and asking questions. You know, and people just say yes. It's been really fun, and it's got better and better and better. Like um, when we started, we didn't really know what we were doing. We we're kind of finding our feet. You know, maybe doing too many gags or whatever. You know, it was, and then it just um, it just kind of finds its own little way. And now we don't have to really think about it. We just do it. Just in the groove. Yeah, it's just a real laugh. You know, we do a little bit of prep before each guest, and then we just let them kind of do their thing it's really fun so when Buster got back together a few years ago was there an immediate camaraderie between all of you again because just listening to you all on that you can hear the joy between you all or was it baby steps for a while it was um it was baby steps for a while like um I was really an- anxious about that I mean when Busted ended the first time it was bad you know it was like we were not friends in like a really weird way like me and James were and me and Charlie kind of were but James and Charlie definitely weren't And me and Charlie were to a degree, but there was a very clear line that was a separation from Busted, you know, so he definitely made that line in the sand and was moved on, you know, so there wasn't much contact. And then we hadn't really spoken to him for like eight years or something before we knocked on his door. (laughs) And um, he'd been contacting James anyway, and they'd be kind of chatting and then we kind of went around to sit in his house. But it was definitely baby steps. And the one thing that worried me was writing, because that's where we always fell to pieces with Busted, because, um, you know, you've kind of got three guys who all have strong points of view, you know, which is problematic in a writing room. 
I was really worried about that. That's why the album Night Driver happened, because we couldn't have made a busted style album at that point in time. We just couldn't have. It was very apparent that there was the, there was a few unsaid things about the past that we hadn't talked about. And that's kind of horrible. You've got feeling that in your gut. Part of me was like, do you really want to be a child? You know, part of me, that was in my head because I love this band. <laughs> I kind of only want to do it if it's going to be what I think people will love. You know, it's a really weird time, that beginning. But then we went off to Minneapolis to write some songs together just to get out of the way because we were like, as soon as we've seen the studio together, at that point, if someone had got a picture of the three of us, it would have been out and it would have put too much pressure on it. And to be honest, we didn't even know if it was going to happen. We were just like, we didn't even know if we can be in a room together and not rip each other's heads off. You know, I don't know what's going to happen. And also, without being dramatic, between the age of 21 and 32, you change so much as people, you know. But in fact, you kind of change for the better, really, because the stuff that you gave a shit about becomes so unimportant. The stuff that you really think mattered, like, I don't know, getting Kerrang! magazine to like us or whatever the fuck that was, whatever the fuck we had in our minds that we really secretly wanted, suddenly meant absolutely nothing to us. But between us, we kind of we kind of found this kind of like this kind of like one one love of kind of like um, one love kind of joint kind of love of the 80s power pop and kind of like phil collins and you know and all these kind of like amazing artists and these sounds and these records that we all loved and we were like let's just write some of that for a couple of days and just have fun you know like and not worry about if it's right for the band or not let's just write some music together and see what happens and it ended up becoming an album called night driver which was our comeback album fucking great album man. do you know what there was a time when i was like oh that was a mistake you know <laughs> there was a time when i thought that but then i listened to it the other day and i was driving and um and i hadn't drove a car for more than five minutes <laughs> For like a year. I did that. And I had, I had to drive to Hammersmith. That's like an hour drive. I was like, wow, I'm going to drive for an hour. And I got in the car and I put Night Driver on. I was like, fucking hell, I love this record. It's such a great moment in our lives. And I think it will be something that I don't think that Busted have a legacy or anything. But I think um, if you went back in the timeline of Busted, it was an important thing for us to make at that point in time. And there's some really great songs on it, like really great songwriting on it. Did you get any love from like different areas of music? Because that whole synth wave movement is massive. I think some people picked up on that a little bit, but we didn't really go too far into that world. We kind of tiptoed a little bit in there. I mean, it worries me what the next Busted album will be because James is fully engrossed in synth mania at the moment my god is he obsessed like he goes to these weird shops that just sell leads he finds these motherboards from somewhere and goes and tracks them down and you know if you plug this through this other configurator blah, 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 i'm like wow dude you fucking you lost me mate give me a sans on call cool. but because of that record because of going there it kind of allowed us to then when it came to the next record we're like right what are we gonna you know we tried so many different things with the writing of the next record like halfway there was the product of six different directions going wrong really wow yeah like trying this going because of because of night driver we could have kind of gone anywhere really from that record it was such a departure from busted it was only after just falling on our face again and again and again and again and again like writing 50 songs that were kind of like we're and going to different producers like we went to you know we went to so many different people to try and find a sound or find what we're looking for and in the end it came from me and dougie from mcfly wrote a song years ago which had this really cool riff which was this like a bass riff and it was fucking awesome it was such a fun riff to play it sounded like kind of boxcar racer or something it was so much fun but the song was shit <laughs> like the song <laughs> the song was garbage you know so so it's like we had really fun writing this riff and we kind of wrote something around it really we just really enjoyed playing this riff together so i just kind of bought the riff and gave it to charlie on his computer i was like what do you think of that and he was like that's great who's that i was like that's just a song me and doug wrote you know it's just a riff that we got and we wrote this song called 90s in like 10 minutes from that riff we were like oh oh let's just write a busted album <laughs> yeah, that's the course. springboard away we course, go you know of course and let's like rectify maybe some wrongs that we made on records in the past and work with someone who we think would make a busted record sound fucking great. And it really, it was really fun. It was really fun. We got to work with Gil Norton, who produced the Foo Fighters and so many amazing albums he's made. You know, So it was a, a real privilege to work with him. Yeah, and I loved that record, the Halfway There record. I loved it. It's really insane for me as an outsider, so I can't imagine how it is for the three of you. But like the Busted Train was originally only like three years once the band broke. 
that's crazy because it seemed much longer. It seemed like you were around. For I know, a I know. Long time. Is that because we're just getting older? <laughs> I, th- I think so. I think that's exactly it. But actually, we were talking about that because we've been a band for like almost double the time that we were a band for the first time now. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. It's so it's so weird, you know, but like it really was like this, um, you know, it's weird. It's such a bubble. It's such a condensed, unbelievable, like it's kind of a weird kind of thing to think about because it was so, it kind of feels like it happened to someone else sometimes when I think about it the first time we busted because I think about the time when me and James met and we started writing songs and then we got a record deal and all of a sudden, it was a completely different life. Do you know what I mean? Like all of a sudden, almost almost within a few months, life was different forever. Just shot from a cannon. <laughs> yeah, shot from a cannon. But uh, it was really, 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 really a strange environment to be in, you know, and also a train that was really fast and moving at an incredible speed that you were too scared to stop at any point because you thought you'd fall, you know? So it was like, it was a really crazy ride. Obviously, inevitably ended up being too much for us, you know, well, especially Charlie. And it was, um, and it was time to stop. I mean, we achieved such an amazing, incredible thing in those three years, but I don't really feel like I ever enjoyed any of it. Do you know what I mean? Like properly enjoyed it. It was always the next thing. Like by the time the single had come out, we'd shot the video for two more singles. By the time we were still promoting the last single of the first album, when we were finishing a video for the first single of the second album, it was so fast paced. And I think everyone but us knew it was going to explode, but from within, but didn't want to tell us. Do you know what I mean? Like, so everyone was just like, get as much as you can from these boys as possible because it's going to fucking blow up. And that was really what it was. Like, we, we didn't have days off. You had a day off. It was just, wow, I've got like, um, I remember we had one week off once. And I just got pissed at my mates in London for a week and went to shows and stuff. And Charlie went to like some resort, like some weird island and came back really brown. And I was like, wow. It just, <laughs> but it felt like such a long time that we'd been away from each other, which is only a week, but we'd spent every waking moment together for, you know, years, you know, so it was a, um, it was um, it was really weird to think back on those times, but it was it was incredible. I loved it. You know, when I think back, I don't think badly. You know, I wouldn't change a thing. Is it Molesy, Surrey you grew up in? Yes, yeah, yeah, Molesy. What were kind of your earliest memories growing up there? Because you were like pretty hyperactive, right? Yeah, I've got um, I'm a proper ADHD kid. My earliest memories, really, when I think about it, were caravan parks. Like there was a lot of holidays in caravan parks. When I think about my youth, I think of I think of caravans and 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 kind of like they were a big part of my life. Where was that at? Was that in that area, or did you just like go on summer holidays? We were just holidays. That's all I can think of. Is like whenever we were on holiday, we were in a caravan somewhere, you know. So it was um, they were kind of my earliest memories. And I think you know my brother playing music in our bedroom. I think of quite a lot. He was such an influence on me, and he hated the fact he was an influence on me. Why? Because you were following him around all the time. Yeah, I was really I was really liked what he liked and he didn't like that for instance he he had a chili peppers poster on his wall and i wasn't allowed to listen to the chili peppers when i come in the bedroom he'd turn them off because that was his thing and green day i remember he um his best friend chris day had dookie and um and they had the vinyl and i remember looking at it for what seemed like hours those pictures on the front of the album oh you could study it forever like you could study it for hours and I'd still discover new things every time I'd pick it up and look at it. And then we formed a band, me, my brother and Chris, our first band called Sabotage in the bedroom. And I played drums and we were terrible in playing music in our bedrooms. But it was um, it was so fun playing Sex Pistols covers and Green Day covers and all this kind of stuff. All the kind of music that like you were listening to at that time, you know, so it was um, it was really, really fun. And this love of performing came and then i think out of the blue through a course of events which was out of my hands i ended up getting a fucking audition for a theater school in london was that something to do with like someone heard you singing karaoke yeah yeah yeah. basically i sang i sang in um i sang in a talent show in a caravan park because my mum made me because if you win you win a caravan for another week called finals week so if you win the talent show you get another week's holiday for free she was like, you know, fucking you're doing a talent show. And I was like, all right, God. You know, so I had to go and sing that. I sung Don't Look Back in Anger. And I sung it. And someone there knew someone who worked at Sylvia Young and they were writing a musical and they wanted people who didn't sound like stage school kids to sing on it because it was all about homeless kids and they wanted kind of people with real voices to sing on it. And so they asked me to go along. I went along, met them. They were like, oh, there's some auditions at Sylvia Young. You should go. And I was like, 
all right? And didn't know nothing about any of this stuff. Didn't even really know what that place was. I thought it was a place that famous people had been to. I remember knowing that, like Sylvia Young, like I'd heard that name. Pretty sure like someone from EastEnders went there, you know, like I'm pretty sure it's a big deal. And how old was you at this point? I was 14, just going into GCSE years, like 14 years old. And like, I was a pretty fucking naughty kid as well, like at 14. Like, I was pretty pretty badly behaved. Then you have, after when you get older, you look back and you go, fucking hell, it's a nightmare. But yeah, I was really, I was real annoying little shit. But not not really, not a bad kid. Just like, why he was always in the middle of it. I was always, sorry, fuck, I didn't mean, everyone was doing it, you know, like, that kind of thing, you know. Was it ever like diagnosed as ADHD back then? Or was it like, oh, give him a chocolate bar and get him to sit in the No, not back then, no. But that wasn't really, that wasn't really a thing back then. You were just a naughty kid. But this is the thing, like I was always kind of, um, I always had this insecurity and this weird feeling that I was really thick as shit because I was at school. Like I couldn't do work. I couldn't do the basic shit that other kids could do because I couldn't sit fucking still. <laughs> I couldn't physically, you give me a book, right? And you tell me, I'm going to give you hundred pounds if you read those four pages in the next 10 minutes. And I go, all right. I couldn't fucking do it. Something within me would not allow me to do it. I'd be tapping, I'd be doing something. You know, my brain would be thinking of a hundred things. And if I did read the four pages, I couldn't tell you what the fuck I'd read on them because my mind was elsewhere whilst I was reading them. You know, which is not good for school. So school and me did not go well. But give me something I liked. Give me a script and I could learn it in an hour. Give me a song and I'd have the words and the melody down after two listens. Little things like that. Like if I was into something, I could kind of like find this weird hyper focus where I could really be in a different zone and kind of go and really zone in on it. And it's only later in life I've discovered what that is and what that means and what that fucking all was. And I think it's much more, I think people are much more aware of this in kids now rather than they're just naughty kids who are thick. You know, it's like, oh, they're just brains are slightly chemically wired, chemically different than other people's, you know, and um, and it probably would have been good to have these skills if you were a hunter, you know, or something back in the day. Maybe you could hyper-focus on killing the fucking bear or whatever, you know, but not be so good at lighting the fire or whatever. I don't know, you know, but do you know what I mean? Like, so it's um, it probably, that's probably why it genetically happened or I don't really know, but um, but yeah, it was a real problem at school for me. You know, school was not good. Like I didn't enjoy it. I was always in trouble. School ended at 4.30 for me every day when it ended at 3.30 for all my mates because I was in detention every night. It just ended an hour later. I knew it was going to happen. It was inevitable. You know, I was always in detention. I never did any homework. Do you have a lot of friends though? Do you have a core group of friends? Yeah, loads and loads of mates. Like it was really cool. Like I got along really well with people like I was really good I was really you know I was a bit socially awkward but I found ways of dealing with that by being really over the top and really the one who was the first to jump off the bridge into the water I mean, like that guy. We got to see what Matt's going to do next. <laughs> exactly. Like I was the fun guy. You wanted me at the party until it became an age where you didn't. You know. <laughs> but but let's let's talk about that. But um, but like um, um, but um, yeah, it was a real it was a real struggle kind of school for me. I find that really difficult. Like I look back at it now, and especially because I'm going through it again now with homeschool with my kids. Like I'm watching them do stuff which I don't know fractions and decimals and shit that they're learning. I'm like. I don't know any of this. I literally, I don't know any of it. And they're probably expecting you to know it as well. Yeah, like my <laughs> nine-year-old's like, Dad, what's this? I'm like, dude, I don't fucking know. I don't know. I have no idea. I really don't. Problem is, that interests me now. I'm like, oh, I'd like to learn about that. What's, um, you know, what's this thing you do? PSRE? What's that? Physics? Ethics? I'm like, wow, that sounds fucking, that sounds like philosophy. I was like, wow, you study that shit? Wow, that sounds cool. You know, I'll be interested in that now. You know, so it's um, it's funny, isn't it? It's only now that I'm interested in stuff that I didn't, I would never have thought I'd give a shit about. You know, but performance was always something which you gravitated to. Yeah, like I said, I was I was quite a socially awkward person. Like I didn't know what to do in social situations. Like I didn't know what the appropriate things were to say. So I'd either be quiet or I'd not stop talking about something random and bollocks. Like I remember like um, we used to have this key that you'd fill the gas up with. You'd have to go to the local shop and get your gas on it, right? And so once a week, it was my part of my chores and I'd have to go and I'd get 20 pounds in my pocket or whatever it was, five, 10 pounds of that week. And I'd go to the local shop and I'd stand in the queue. I'd have to talk to the grown up and have to say, can I have 10 pounds on the gas, please? Or something. And it would fill me with fear and dread. And like, I'd hate it. The walk there, I'd be sweating. I'd be so nervous because I don't know. I don't know why. I just had this real weird kind of like feeling of 
social awkwardness or kind of like, I don't know what it was. I just felt insecure and weird and talking to anybody. You know, then suddenly you discover alcohol and I was like, oh, I'm going to fucking talk to anyone, you know, and um, mix cocaine in the mix oh, and I can shit. fucking take over the world, you know. So, um, you know, so it was a real, um, it was a real, it was, a, it was obviously going to happen. You know, when I look back on those times, I really, the older I get, I kind of give myself more of a break, you know, because for years I kind of felt like quite insecure and quite bad about my education. The fact that I was uneducated, I didn't really feel very, especially next to Charlie, who was so clever and smart. I've been to some posh school and boarding school and knew so much about so many things. I was just like, I'm fucking some idiot, you know, like he doesn't know anything. But the older I've got, the less of a less of a shit I've given about that. More happy within yourself. Yeah, I found a way. I found my way. I'm kind of like I'm quite comfortable with my way. There seems to be like different types of performers. There's those who are like really quiet and shy in day to day life, but on stage they like develop this alter ego. Then there's those who are animated all the time and I guess destined to be on stage. Were you more of the latter or do you kind of fall in the middle? That's really funny because I think um, I am the first one you said, but I found a, I found a pretend guy that I can be. So I think after a while I developed skills to deal with these things, right? So to deal with certain aspects of my personality which weren't working. Even when I think of busted, when I think of the guy that's on stage, that's not really me. You know, he's like a really hyper, over-the-top animated version of myself, which I created to deal with the fact I was terrified. Do you know what I mean? And um, and this guy happened, who's ah, horse faces <laughs> and jumps around and does all this stuff and says, fuck yeah, and stuff like this, which um, after a while, towards the end of Busted, I couldn't let that guy go. Was that guy coming off stage with you? That guy was coming off stage. That guy was everywhere, you know, and I, and I feel like I had to live up to that a little bit. Or maybe that was just an excuse to party like a fucking dickhead too much, you know, I don't know. But yes. Yeah, so I kind of worked out these ways to kind of deal with those things and kind of like find that the more I went for it, the less uncomfortable I felt. It's with certain things, isn't it? Like, it's like, if you have to dance, right? If you have to dance, I mean, I hate fucking dancing at things. Like if you're at a wedding or something and I'm like, oh my God, I've got to fucking dance. I've got to, you know, like, oh my God, I would be mortified. But the more you go for it, the less fucking awkward you feel, right? In the same context, I found that with personality. The more I went, right, let's, let's just go for it in every possible way, the less awkward I felt in social situations, the less shy I felt, which unfortunately led me into some scenarios which got me into fuckloads of trouble. <laughs> but it was my way of coping with being weird and shy and not wanting to be somewhere. And when someone asked me a question, wanting to freeze and not knowing what to say, it's just a coping mechanism, I think. It's weird because then there's those other people who are kind of loud and animated all the time. But if you put them on a spotlight, on a stage they'd freeze up there's also those kind of people as well yeah no totally totally but it really it really helps with um all these kind of things that i did and when, when i think about them now i'm a much more centered kind of person now <laughs> you know i've kind of dealt with a lot of demons you know shall we say and i've had a lot of fucking therapy you know to kind of work through certain problematic areas of my life shall we say so i'm uh, i'm much better at it now but it really helps with character development for acting and stuff like i can really fucking go to town on writing someone's backstory and find finding out who they are and picking lines here and there from scripts to tell me everything I need to know about somebody. You know, like I can really, um, because I've made these characters up to live my day-to-day -day life in some ways, finding characters within, in an acting world, I find quite easy. I love building a character. Like if someone gives me a script, the more like me they are, the less I want to do it. Do you know what I mean? But if I can be someone else, I'm like wicked. I think that's the attraction of why a lot of people like to play like really nasty people in films because it is like, yeah yeah it's just like the total flip side of it yeah i think that is so attractive isn't it is and, and also i was trying to explain to my son recently that you are not your thoughts which is such a weird thing to explain to a nine-year-old you know he thought something and he was like he felt like a terrible person because he'd had this thought and i was like dude I have fucked up thoughts all the time. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to say that. I'm glad I'm not the only one. <laughs> yeah, but you know what I mean? Like you can think all kinds of things. That's what brains do is they're constantly thinking the whole fucking time, especially mine. You know, mine doesn't stop. <laughs> but, you know, it's um, it's what you do that counts. And also just because you think something doesn't make it true, which is something which I've had to find out the hard way, you know. So it was a real interesting chat I had with him. And it was kind of quite enlightening for me. I was like, oh, all right, okay, cool. My thought patterns changed. 
<laughs> you know, I'm able to, you know, talk about grown up shit to a nine year old, you know, fuck. Would you say you was from kind of like a working class background growing up? Yeah, very much so. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. How was that for you, like entering like the Sylvia Young education? Was it an easy decision for you for a career? Or was you see, was people like seeing it? Oh, Matt's a bit of a dreamer going into this kind of route because it's not your conventional kind of route. I mean, I'm sure everyone thought I was full of shit, you know, like when I was younger because I was quite, I was like, no, we're going to be huge. I'm going to be, you know, whatever, you know, I think I would have been one of those guys who said all that shit. I'm not sure, but I probably would have, you know, said those kind of things. But um, I don't know. It was quite weird. For instance, none of my Sylvia Young friends ever came to my house. I did feel a bit insecure and a bit insignificant. There was a few people in my class who were kind of from working, like Amy Winehouse was in my class. She was from a working class background. We had a connection there. And I talked differently to a lot of people in my class. But like, there was a lot of kids from all kinds of backgrounds in there, you know, and there was really openly gay kids for the first time. I'd never met an openly gay person in my life. And suddenly there was openly gay teachers and openly gay kids. And it was a really eye-opening moment coming from this kind of very narrow-minded working class background to being exposed to suddenly like this huge huge massive world of different people and personalities and lives and and possibilities probably a great time because what would you be like because you'd be a teenager at that point probably an ideal time because you're just like this yeah sponge i was 14 for 15 I was 14, 15 and my life completely changed. But in such an amazing way, because I suddenly was like, I saw people doing things. Like for instance, like a girl in my class, when I arrived at the school, after five months left school and I saw her on the front page of Smash Hits magazine and suddenly her name was Billy Piper and she became a huge fucking pop star. She was sat next to me in English. And suddenly she was a huge fucking pop star. Everyone knew who she was. Massive for a very short period of time, but massive, you know, and like she's a huge actress now. She does really fucking amazing work. But she sat next to me in English, you know, and so suddenly I was like, wow, this shit can actually happen to people. It certifies it, doesn't it? And no one can argue yeah. with you at that point. Exactly. And yeah, I was like, well, you know, really, it can kind of happen to anyone, you know? So me thinking it's never going to happen to me is kind of silly. But I did feel like I've never really felt exceptionally talented. For instance, James Bourne from my band is ridiculously talented. You give him anything and he will make something happen from it. He's the most fucking weird, bizarre bloke you'll ever meet in your life, but he is gifted with this ability of talent, right? I never really felt like that. But if it's between me and you, I'm going to fucking get it. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't know what it was. And it wasn't an arrogance. I don't know. Like, once I'd seen a possibility, I wasn't willing to go backwards. Do you know what I mean? Like, I wasn't willing to kind of go, well, I'm not going to settle for that. I want this. And there was a definite drive within me from that moment on, from like the age of 15. You get inspired by other people like James rather than feel intimidated by him. Oh my God. I met him and I was like, you're who I've been looking for my entire life. And I'm never going to fucking let you go. <laughs> <laughs> I met him and, and we fit perfectly together because he was musically gifted, but, you know, a little bit unworldly wise, shall we say, like um, not street wise, didn't really know anything about the world, you know. So together we could kind of come up with these songs and these ideas is which were completely perfect for our age group and demographic and generation which in the end in three years time when they come out would be that age group that those 15 11 to 15 year olds you know whoever were busted fans at the time it was a perfect kind of marriage really that happened um, at exactly the right time in both of our lives meeting each other you know so it was a really big thing and then enter charlie who suddenly gave us this new world introduced me to corn and limp biscuit and all these kind of bands just this perfect triangle of personalities really exactly completely but all completely fucking different people like you literally, I mean, you would have heard it in that if you listen to that busted podcast when no one's watching, like you couldn't put three more different people together if you tried. We're like the most odd band in the world. But for some reason, that makes it kind of magic, you know, and so it really kind of works. I mean, we really have nothing in common, the three of us whatsoever, which is really bizarre for three blokes to be in a room and have nothing really in common apart from the Goonies and Back to the Future and these things that we grew up on, you know, like, but I think everyone has those in common, <laughs> you know, like there's a few things which everyone has in common but really we're three very different blokes but that kind of makes it I don't know amazing and, and exciting and fun and different but dangerous you know you never know what the fuck's going to happen which 
it was just exciting. So both you and James were born in 1983, and like you say, their 80s references kind of follow you guys around. Who introduced you to particular films growing up? Because a lot of the big ones would have left the cinema back then. So was it all kind of seeing them on video? Yeah, it was the video shop. We had a local video shop, which me and my brother would go to and just rent the same movies over and over again every week. I mean, The Goonies was huge, you know, for us. Back to the Future I watched probably. Um, And then suddenly one Christmas it came on TV and we recorded it on the VHS and we had our own copy of it. I remember thinking, that's going to save me so much money. You know, (laughs) I'm not going to have to pay £1.50 for this fucking movie anymore. I've got my own copy of it. It was such a big deal. And it had the ad breaks in it, so we had to fast forward them. I probably watched Back to the Future every weekend for two years. Like it was just such a big, you know, inspiring movie for me. You know, it's um, it was such a big moment in my life. Like you say then, being able to record something off the TV and watch it again. I think when we first got our first video, I recorded an episode of The A-Team. And it's probably the shittest episode of The A-Team ever. But because I'd recorded it, I watched it like every day once again. Yeah, from, exactly, from just that one man, episode. Man, exactly, man. Exactly. That's so true. You know, and, and, and also you only had a limited amount of VHSs. So you could only record certain amounts of films. And then if you wanted another one, you had to pick which one you were going to record over. And that was a big fucking deal. But I was like... I think we're going to have to get rid of Back to the Future 2. No! But oh my God, we got to pick one of them, you know, so, um, you know, because Naked Gun's on and I haven't seen it. Let's record it just in case it's good. There's an amazing meme online or something of like an old VHS tape. You might have seen it and you wrote on the spine of the tape with the stickers. Yeah. It said something like Billy's fifth birthday on it and it's been scribbled out and it says Ghostbusters 2 and the meme says, a decision was made here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just the best exactly that is so fucking true it's so the best and i remember before we had a vhs player we had a betamax player i don't know why because no one else had a betamax player nor did could you buy them anywhere but we had one with like four videos i can't remember what they were like my stepdad bought it so they were really shit but like i remember that was so annoying for like a a year i was like why'd you buy that yeah you know like everyone i know has got a vhs player and someone's got a porn video on one of them (laughs) you know could have bought a vhs please I really want to watch this thing. <laughs> Everyone's talking about it in class. Uh, so getting a VHS player was amazing. But um, yeah, man, those movies were, you know, such big parts of our, such integral parts of our life. Have you been able to show them to your kids? Yeah, like we've watched quite a few of them together. Like um, we've kind of gone through most of the catalogue. The only thing I haven't watched with them is Gremlins yet. Okay, yeah. Because they're a bit scared, you know, of certain things. Like certain things scare them. Like the Goonies scared them. Well, Gremlins was a 15 when it came out in the UK, so it's... Was it really? Because oh, I watched it and I thought, I was like, it's a 12. I'm like, no, I think you can deal with that. Or maybe when it was on VHS. Maybe when it was on video, it came out as a 15, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I think I think it was on, on over Christmas and I checked it out. And like, there's this thing on the internet called Common Sense Media, which I'm always checking because I'm like, it says 15, babe, but I'm pretty sure they can watch it. And it's like, check it out. So I go on this thing called Common Sense Media, which is basically like for parents to watch things with their kids. And they say what actual age it is. Let's put Lethal Weapon 2 on, Dad. That's fine. It's only a 15, then Patsy Kensett gets her boobs out, and it's like, damn it. <laughs> exactly, you know, but like, I, th- I think boobs is okay. It's like there's certain things which I think are like, just really horrible violence. I just think, um, you know, like there's certain things, like I really wanted to watch Deadpool with them because I know they'd love it, but um, it's fucking horrible. I watched it recently, and I was, I was, it was on, and I was like, oh, the kids might watch this. And so I put it on when they were in bed, and I was like, they cannot fucking watch this film. <laughs> Not at all. So yeah, that like Gremlins, I really, because that was a big movie for me. Like Gremlins was fucking huge. It's one of the perfect movies, I think, as well. It's just a brilliantly made movie. It's just absolutely perfect. And I really, really love it. Beetlejuice as well was a massive one for me. Like I loved Beetlejuice so much. I watched it a hundred times and I hadn't watched it for years. And I watched it like last year. I'm on Halloween and I still knew loads of the words. And I was like, wow, man. Isn't that weird it's like sometimes you revisit films you've not seen for a while and for some reason you can quote every word it's like holy shit yeah man it's crazy man. how many times did i watch this back in the day dude there was a musical on broadway of beetlejuice and it was fucking brilliant it was absolutely fucking brilliant. I mean, I've only heard the soundtrack. I didn't watch the show. But like the music was incredible. It's funny. Had loads of good references. They picked the best parts of the movie and put them in the songs. I was like, this is fucking brilliant. If this comes to the West End and I'm not playing Beetlejuice, I'm going to be fucking pissed. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so they, these kind of movies were, you know, really big for us, I think. And really big for James as well. Like James was obsessed with certain films. Just like me, but even more. He would have watched, he watched Mighty Dark 
Ducks more than any human I've ever known has watched any movie. I've watched Mighty Ducks a bunch of times as well. Like I'd taken up ice hockey at one point in my life. You know, when I've been to like the stick and puck and never got past that session, but like, because I really wanted to be in the Mighty Ducks, you know, but it was, um, he was, he was the same as me, but to a different level. To be honest, he's from a much richer family than me. And they'd had the ability to watch loads, you know, like and had video players and all this kind of stuff. And I think we were kind of limited to what we could have watched, you know, like for instance, this is not the coolest thing in the world, but the film when I was younger, which first I first watched the most times was Cool as Ice, which was Vanilla Rice's movie. I saw the trailer to that just the other day. <laughs> Did you? I mean, I can't remember anything about it, but I remember being obsessed with Vanilla Ice. Like when I was like, I don't know, eight or nine yeah. or something, like I was being obsessed. And my friend had the fucking movie. So I go around his house like, all the time and we watch Call as Ice. I can't remember how young I was. Really, really young. And I go in his house every possible moment I could to watch Call as Ice with Vanilla Ice. But we're still talking about that guy today. I love that you know man. What I mean, it's like he was a pop star. Yeah, man. He made he did something. Yeah. You know, he did something. I remember actually the first time I got expelled from school. Well, not expelled, the first time I got suspended from school was because I'd been around my mate's house the night before to watch Call as Ice. And the next day I cut my hair with safety scissors to try and get brick into the side of my head because he had bricks like shaved into the side of his head and I was like that's so cool so I tried to cut my hair to look like bricks and all I did was cut chunks of hair out the side of my head DIY job DIY job with safety scissors <laughs> safety children's scissors at primary school idiot so I got sent home to it growing back yeah what an idiot how was it for you guys working within McBusted alongside five other dudes compiling ideas for the tour and stage show that must have been like an 80s reference overload 80s and 90s she had the trailers for the second and tour and all that kind of thing man i mean mcbusted was if i'm honest right i love busted with all my heart it's like my marriage but mcbusted was the best possible affair you could ever have in your life and get away with it it was so much fun because like with busted the word cool comes into play is that cool is that the right is that the cool thing to do i'm like fuck that man just fucking let's do what we like I really hate that word. Whenever it comes into play, when it comes to my music and bands and projects and things, I think it's such a loose term that can mean so many things to so many different people that you're never going to win. What's cool to me is not cool to someone else. You know, so I don't really understand that reference. And there's always a time frame on cool as well. Exactly. Fuck cool. You know, like um, I never think of cool. But I think with McBusted, we had the word rad. <laughs> <laughs> which meant completely different thing. The word cool never came in. It was just like, dude, that's fucking rad. Let's do it. And, and also like before we knew it, like when we announced it, we didn't really know what was going to happen. We kind of had this idea. We were going to kind of go on stage. Charlie was not interested in doing Busted anymore. Hadn't heard from him for eight years. And McFly were kind of ready to do something new. We were kind of in a crossroads in their time as a band. And so we were like, well, maybe we can go on tour together and just play each other's songs together. Like maybe we'll play some Busted songs and McFly will be our backing band and then we'll come off stage for a bit and McFly will play we didn't even know what that was we're just going to work something out so we played a couple of songs at their Royal Albert Hall show we came on and played that clip was amazing can't imagine what it felt for you when those backlights went on with the name yeah but that wasn't the name just the reaction from the crowd that wasn't the name basically the lighting guy couldn't put McFly and Busted on the lights because there was only a certain amount of lights there was only eight lights or something so the last minute just before we went on he put Muck and busted on there then that became the band's name like it was like a flute everybody got it straight away though didn't they totally it was a really really clever move so we owe that light man a lot of money and really we came on because like no one had seen busted for fucking 10 years you know like or however long it would have been like eight years and we went on and we played i think it was crash the wedding in year 3000 dude it was the it was the biggest fucking eruption i've ever heard in my life to anything we've ever done and i didn't expect that because we we're at a mcfly show and I, there was a bit of animosity between mcfly fans and busted in some weird way there was a there was a lot of stuff like i didn't really understand but people had a problem with busted i think in the mcfly fandom i'm not really sure why i don't really still understand it today i think they kind of um thought that we'd overshadowed them or something when really they were our mates who were our support band <laughs> you know like and we fucking james wrote songs with them and they you know wrote songs on our second album you know like it was a, it was a really really open relationship but yes yeah, so i was a bit nervous about that i was like, i don't know how this is going to go down but my god it was like nothing I ever imagined. And then we kind of came off stage and I saw the promoter, our manager and the agent 
having a conversation in the corridor and it looked very intense. Uh, the McFly's manager, who is Busted's old manager, not our manager anymore, just a friend, kind of came in and went, okay, boys, we should have a chat, you know, and was like, and was like, right, okay, cool. And an offer came through for like fucking multiple arenas, like to do this thing. And I was like, oh my God, it's going to happen. You know, it really was the most fun thing I've ever done because it was, um, the word cool never came into play. It was, it was just like, let's make the most fun, exciting, unapologetically fucking over the top thing we could possibly ever do and have a really good time doing it. And if anyone doesn't like something, then we don't do it. We just go with everyone has to love everything. And then by the time we put the first, like, I think we put like 12 shows on sale and they sold out in like literally like minutes. But so by the time we'd finished the one day of announcing the tour, the budget for the tour had like quadrupled. So like we had an insane amount of money to spend on like making the tour. We're just like, look, guys, we're only possibly going to do this once. Let's just spend everything we possibly can on it and just make it fucking amazing. So we can all look back on it as this incredible thing that we did. And we made like the most ridiculously expensive, big, massive arena show. And everyone was like, okay, cool. Dude, hand on heart, two of the best arena gigs I've been to, those two tours. Oh, oh, man, thanks, man. Thank you, mate. For both visually sound as well yeah man yeah yeah i don't know whatever was going off but fucking hell man and just a smile on the face from start to finish superb i'm so pleased you said that it really was um it really was a, an absolute fucking joy to be a part of and also just to kind of you know like i hadn't, I hadn't been in a band for eight years and i was suddenly in a band with no animosity no fucking no resentment no weird shit just like absolute fun and complete great vibes it was just so much fucking fun. And we all knew it wasn't forever. It was an affair that we knew we would do for a couple of years and call it a day. And so when we called it a day, we were all kind of like, cool guys, that was wicked. Love you. See you later. Do you know what I mean? And the door is left open if we ever wanted to do that again. I'm not sure if we would, but it all, we all knew what it was from the beginning. And we all went into it with the best intentions and left with the best intentions. It was a really, I look back at that as the most amazing thing I've done creatively, which will fucking be a dagger in the heart to Charlie Simpson. I'm sorry. And I apologize, Charlie. I love you. But, but it's not busted, which is the difference, right? Because, because however much I loved it, it's not my home, you know, whereas busted is musically something I will be in for the rest of my life because it means something to me. It's part of who I am. I loved how the kind, the dynamic kind of changed with him, McBusted, because you always associate Tom as kind of, let's say the lead singer or the focus from mm. a public's point of view. But whereas McBusted, it kind of became you and Danny, the front men in a way. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think in Busted, Charlie is the front man, but at the time he wasn't very good at the chat. You know, like, so he wasn't very good at kind of talking to the crowd. Whereas I was hyped up on everything, you know, and was like, all right, give me the fucking mic, I'll roll. And also I loved Blink-182 so much. At the beginning of with Busted, I just copied what they did and cut some of the swearing and cock jokes out because it was inappropriate for the audience. You know, so that's all I did. You know, it's just like pretty much copy what they did. You did the PG version. But the slightly PG <laughs> version. The PG version that the parents would slightly disapprove of. But I always loved that because I always thought like... How much can I get away with? How much can I get away with? You know, exactly, exactly that. Um, and I'm still getting away with that now. I'm still kind of pushing it to the point where we played this gig at Blackpool, um, our last ever show with busted a couple of years ago for the time being we knew it was going to be our last show for a while and so we really enjoyed it like charlie was wasted and we we're just we we're, were just having a really great time coming what it was it was like the end of the summer it was on blackpool beach thousands of people that was a really big gig and we were just having a really great time suddenly someone came in my in-ear monitors and went um hey guys and it was our tour manager in our in-ears and i was like what the fuck that never happens he goes hey guys um i can't believe i'm actually having to say this but the mayor is stood next to me and if you don't stop swearing he's gonna pull the gig and i was like what <laughs> i looked around and i was like what and he was like seriously dude seriously they're all really upset and i was like oh shit okay okay cool and i suddenly looked out and i could see all these kids on dad's shoulders and stuff and i was like oh this isn't a busted gig this is a a summer party that we've just crashed and made into a you know but we were used to playing busted shows the busted fans i was suddenly uh suddenly brought back to earth all my language is inappropriate 
and my cock jokes are not going down well. How is the buzz for you when acting on screen or in theatre, which you do a lot of, compared to playing live? Is it a totally different rush? Yeah, I can't I can't really compare the two. I mean, of it, I think people think this all performance, all the kind of same thing, but it's so different. I can't really even describe. For instance, stage, I love. I love theatre so much. Like, I like TV and film. I'd love to do more of it. Like, I'm writing a lot of that stuff at the moment, which has been a real different, fun, explorative thing for me to do. And I'm really enjoying that process. And I'd love to make some of the films that we're writing right now. Like, that would be a dream. But I find making film and TV not as enjoyable as I do stage. Because there's something about getting another go tomorrow, which um, is so amazing for me. Because whatever happens, I'm like, okay, I can walk off stage and go, tomorrow we get to do it again if it's good wicked it gets to do it again if it's bad doesn't matter i get to do it again or if i make a mistake that is a choice that i make okay learn from that move on you know like there's something about that which i really like whereas um in film and tv like i'm at a place within my career where I can't fucking make a mistake. Do you know what I mean? I'm employed. If I get a part on TV, I'm a day player who turns up and has to do a fucking job. Let's do the job you've been paid for. And God forbid that I don't do that job. You know, that's how I feel when I step on a set as a day player on a TV show. And when it comes to film, it's slightly different because um, the, all the films I've done have been involved with Dom, you know, and so we get on so well that we get to kind of talk about things and really explore things. But, you know, time is money. And there's definitely the pressure that I feel personally that I feel like I need I have so much more work to do as an actor. Every time I step on stage, I'm like, I have so much more to do. I have so much more to learn. I have so far to go, which is not bad. It's exciting. I'm like, cool, bring it on. I'm 37 and I'm ready to fucking learn. Um, I treat every job as a blessing and I, and, I, and I really do. And I really am so stoked to be there. And I even treat every uh, every audition now in the same way, which is um, a new way I've started to look at auditions because I started to get too attached to getting the job and which can be hard for an actor, I think. Well, it's hard for me like because I go, oh my God, this is it. If I get this, fucking wow, this will change everything and be amazing part. I love it so much. Put too much on it. Put too much pressure on it. And um, whereas now I treat every audition as a chance to act. Great, dad get to play this guy for an hour and a half and put it on tape and send it off and who fucking knows, which is a really good mindset for me. Is there a different rush between going on stage in theatre and going on stage at a gig? Yeah, going on stage in the gig, I'm in my comfort zone, I'm ready. I mean, the first date of a tour is terrifying, always, because there's a few moving parts to a big show, which if they don't happen, piss you off. If the big explosion doesn't happen or the big thing doesn't happen or the lights don't go on at a certain moment, you're like, oh, fuck. So that's always a bit, you know, worrying. Or you forget the transition between this song and this song. Oh, fuck that, I'm sorry. You know, that, that's always a bit worrying. But for 95% of it, I'm ready and I know what I'm doing and I'm prepared and I'm kind of on call. Whereas with, um, with stage work, I'm always terrified always like every fucking night every matinee every show i'm a nervous wreck but i love it it makes me feel alive and i walk on stage and something happens but i am nervous every time every single time i'm if you see me before going on stage you wouldn't believe it's me i'm really 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 nervous but i i've learned ways to deal with that and to get through that you know but that never goes away for me i'm always i'm always terrified but um in the best possible way i was thinking Elliot, is there any other kind of outlet where you can truly express yourself both emotionally and physically as when you're playing in a band i thought maybe a solo performance like solo performance art but any other kind of medium seems to have restrictions such as a script and a director and all that. i couldn't think of anything else where yeah I mean, as in like throwing shapes and expressing your body yeah. and energy i can't think yeah, of anything man. else no i can't think of it i can't i can't think of anything like that you're right and also like for me it's the most um i don't know it's the one chance i get to leave everything there you know like to really go right okay this is everything I fucking have. And I, and I treat every gig like that. And I come off stage and I know I've done it. You know, I've left everything I possibly could on there. And you maybe didn't even notice what I was doing over there by the bass amp for that minute that I was fucking doing this thing that was I was really into. But, you know, I was leaving every, uh, uh, every, every moment of me is like, boom, yeah. you know, there you go. Because I owe it to you because you fucking, I can't believe I'm doing this job. I can't fucking believe I'm doing this. You know, I'm so, 
I'm so grateful and stoked to be there that I'm so thankful that I give everything I possibly can. And I'm lucky to work with people who do the same. And especially in McBusted, like we come off, man. And we were like, we'd had to have a physio come on tour with us because we were like athletes. We were fucked. We were like, we're like, I can't jump anymore. My fucking shins are killing me. You know, like it was so weird, you know, but it was, um, that was all about the performance and the show, which was so great. But luckily we had great music and we had great songs and we could all play. Whereas Busted, I think is a bit more about, um, we focus a bit more on sound and a bit more on making sure we're a good band and which is uh definitely charlie's influence you know like um he is brilliant and he's fantastic to be in a band with because of that and he has standards which i love um uh, whereas more busted it was all about performance we were just like well well we had like two months rehearsal as well the longest rehearsal i've ever done for anything in my life so you guys were ready oh we were totally <laughs> ready because we knew we had to forget about that we had to we had to be ready we had to play everything we knew everything backwards knew every fucking note of everything that we could do it in our sleep because we knew how to physically demanding the show was going to be I, I can imagine what it's like can't, actually i can't imagine what it's like for someone like beyonce who has to do those dance routines while singing her fucking tits off you know like in these massive stadiums you know like i watched um a show of hers on tv a little while ago and i was like oh my god how can we ever complain or moan this woman is unbelievable just next level commitment and self-assurance like i was watching her i was like she's so confident it was like it was like wow i want to be more like beyonce (laughs) (laughs) matt thank you ever so much matt i could chat all day oh i could chat all day too man thank you very much i really enjoyed this it's been a fun little time thanks a lot all right dude well you take care and i'll speak to you soon take care bro all the best mate bye-bye Thank you so much to Matt Willis of Busted for chatting with me here on the Straight to Video podcast. That really was a lot of fun and I hope it came across that way too. Please go and follow Matt's own podcast when no one's watching, which is a ton of fun. And make sure to check out the Busted back catalogue, particularly their recent albums Night Driver and Halfway There. Cheers to everyone who has sent words of encouragement for this show and continuing to check out every episode which I drop on Tuesdays and Fridays. All previous chats can be found at stvpod.com along with straight to video music and videos and if i could ask a tiny tiny favor to anyone listening on apple podcasts if you wouldn't mind leaving a review or rating that would really help spread the word most of all though just thanks for listening it really means a lot and i can't wait to chat to you all again soon (laughs) 